Okay, what a blessing it is to be here. What a blessing it is to have fellowship. But I'll just get everyone to sit down and then you can continue the fellowship after church. So if you want to grab your Bibles, this morning I'm reading from John chapter 6, verses 60 to 71. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do not take offence at this. Then what if if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But you... But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those who were did not believe and who who was who sorry and who it was who would betray him. And he said, This is why I told you that no one come to me unless it granted him by the Father. After this, many of his, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. May God bless the reading of his word. Thanks, brother, for reading God's Word to us. Uh, My name's Darren. If I haven't had the privilege of meeting you, one of the pastors here at Coomera Baptist Church, and um, as you can feel in the room, there's um, there's more bodies in the room, and as as people um, gather each week, just a real practical thing, uh, if you want to shoot to aim to gather um, 5, 10, 15 minutes earlier, uh, that would be so encouraging. And then as you make your way in, um, flock to the, to the middle of each of the rows. That would be great just so uh, people can, can gather on the outside and then uh, parents can hang out the back. But just a practical thing. Uh, but if you are a visitor, so glad you're here. Uh, we are in the series going through the book of John. So what I'd love to do is I'd love to pray and then open up with a question. So let's turn to God and pray now. Lord, your word says, it is the spirit who gives life, and the flesh is no help at all. And so in this moment, Lord, in this time, we would pray that your spirit would grant us ears to hear and eyes to see, and that your spirit would produce life in us. We pray for your name's sake. Amen. So I want to begin with a simple question. Have you ever found some truths hard to hear? Have you ever found some truths hard to hear? Uh, Maybe, hypothetically, you're a woman who has got a new haircut and you've decided to go for the fringe. And a very trusted friend has told you, I see what you were going for, but it hasn't quite worked. Some truths might be hard to hear. Maybe you were like me after four months of married life. Uh, hopping on the scales, realizing that I had in fact made some progress. I'd added nine kilograms in four months. And that truth was, well, to be honest, was a little bit hard to hear. Um, some truths in life are hard to accept, hard to hear. The life isn't fair. Hard work doesn't always pay off. Churches aren't perfect. Work hard for your Uh, employer and you'll stay employed forever, Uh, that the TV show Friends is a comedy. Um, Some truths are hard to accept. I find the last one particularly difficult to accept. Well, sometimes uh, hard truths to accept are more personal, aren't they? They're not about superficial things. Maybe they're about you. Maybe you've heard someone correct the way you speak to your spouse. Maybe you've had someone lean in to the way you're parenting. Maybe you've been corrected 
I was told at work, if you do not work harder and get your act together, you will be let go. Some truths are just hard to hear. Well, have you ever found some of Jesus' truths hard to hear? Have you ever found some of Jesus' teachings hard to take? Maybe you're familiar with some. Ones like, uh, whoever wants to be my disciple must take up his cross, deny himself and come follow me. Jesus is saying, you need to be prepared to be publicly shamed in, in uh, following Jesus. Or what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul? Money isn't everything and it might cost you everything. Or, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no life in you. Jesus says some hard things, doesn't he? And yet, sadly, what the temptation to do in the world today is when it comes to Jesus is to not receive his hard sayings, but try and soften them out, to turn Jesus into more of an easygoing Jesus, a kind of easygoing Jesus who's always on your side, who never really contradicts you, always accommodates your sin, never really disagrees with you, a Jesus who's there to help you out, make you feel a little bit better, support all your decisions, affirm all your choices, and he'll never contradict, correct, or rebuke you. Well, is this easygoing Jesus the Jesus of the Bible? <laughs> is, is the easygoing Jesus actually the Jesus we are hearing about in this passage and have been encountering through the Gospel of John so far? Today, we're going to look at three hard sayings of Jesus and two responses. So, we find ourselves in the story. Jesus has been having a dialogue with a listening audience that at first was keen to hear. Then they began grumbling. Then they did, began disputing. And now they've become offended. We see that from verse 41, 52. And the things that this, um, this group were disputing was the claims of Jesus' exclusivity, his origin, and his necessary death. So that's, that's the Jews. They, they aren't happy with what Jesus is saying. But there's a wider audience now that responds that have been following Jesus along the way. And now they're going to have to decide what are they going to do with the words and the teachings that they've heard from Jesus. Look at me in verse 60. It says, When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? People responding here refer to his disciples. When John's using this term, disciple, he's referring to the wider group of people who are following Jesus, more than just the 12. Those perhaps who have watched Jesus' miracles, been listening to his teachings and hearing his words. Maybe this group of disciples or simple followers of Jesus might be a group that we would call churchgoers, people who, who go to church maybe a, a wider group that maybe even include those who gather here today. Now, at first, they liked what they heard. They liked what they saw. But, but when they got up close to Jesus, oh, they did not like his teachings. They found him hard. Have you known people like this? Who, who begin following Jesus with a, a kind of enthusiasm, a kind of zeal, a kind of um, bright light. But eventually... They encounter some of Jesus' harder sayings, and it all just proves too much. His words are either the fire that warms your heart, or they are the light that will drive you away. But when Jesus' words speaks his words, they always stir up a response, don't they? You, you, you're never meant to kind of remain apathetic or indifferent to Jesus' words. You're always left with some kind of response. That was true then, and it's true now. And so these verses for us are crucial today because they, they help discern between true and false disciples. Those who are along for the ride when it's suitable and comfortable and those who are truly serious about following Jesus. And the way the, sift, the, way the kind of movement or discerning takes place is, by, is their response to the hard sayings. Now, when Jesus said, when they say here, disciples, this broader group says, this is a hard saying. This isn't so much hard to understand as it is hard to accept. It's not hard to understand like bovine spongiform encephalopathy is. 
But in fact, it's hard to accept. Like, who can listen to it? Who can, who can take on what you're saying? You notice they offered no follow-up questions. Would you mind clarifying for me, Jesus, the blood, the, the, the body piece? They said no. They actually had a kind of a protest position. Who can listen to your words? You see, the problem wasn't actually with the parts they didn't understand. The problem was with the parts they did. For they understood what Jesus was saying. He was saying, you need to wholeheartedly rely on me in my death, otherwise you will not have eternal life. That's the meaning of verse 58. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. The bread is Jesus. He comes from heaven. And only as you come and rely on His life-giving death will you experience eternal life. Will you live forever? Can, can you see why some people find it quite offensive? The exclusive claim? Divine origin? The Savior who'll die? That's not who some of these disciples had come to follow. No, they wanted a victorious Messiah. They wanted someone to stick it to the Roman authorities. They were after the Messiah who's going to help advance their, their values and, and their kind of ideas and their programs. They, they wanted a champion, not some, some loser who's going to die. But Jesus makes it abundantly clear. Unless you rely on my death, you will not have a shot at eternal life. Necessity of the cross, the necessity of Christ alone, it's a hard saying to accept, isn't it? People want to make allowances. People want to make excuses. People want to allow many roads to get to God. Jesus says, no, you need to come to, come to me alone. See, I think in our human frame, we're often looking to keep our options open, aren't we? When it comes to wholeheartedly relying on Jesus' death, keeping our options open. We're tempted to, to downplay our sin a little bit, that it's not all that bad. We've been tempted to downplay our problem in that we're stuck in sin, but we actually think we might be able to get ourselves out. We want to leave the door open a little bit. But Jesus says, no, that's not the case. Nothing less than wholehearted reliance on my death is what's required. We're sinners, we're stuck, and we're in need of a Savior. But that is offensive to those who think they're morally sorted. If you think you're morally sorted, if you think a little bit of good enough is, in fact, good enough, and you'll find Jesus' claims quite offensive. People who think you don't want to be one of those full-on Christians. I'll just be around. I'll, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a full-on born-again Christian. I'm a Christian. Let's not get too extreme here and actually take God's Word seriously. Have you ever experienced the offense of Jesus before? Have you ever heard or felt the sting of God's Word coming to your life, correcting rebuking, chastising? I hope so. <laughs> because if you haven't felt the correction of Jesus, if you've never felt that His words have somehow offended your, you and your flesh, you perhaps either A, don't know Jesus very well, or B, don't know yourself very well. Because this side of eternity, we're all a project. We ain't finished yet. The Word of God will come to our flesh and it will correct and it will rebuke, and it will chisel away at us. And some of the times it will be offensive. What will we do when the hard sayings of Jesus come to us? Will we turn and walk away, or will we say, this might be hard to accept, but I will accept it by faith. I will receive it by faith. You're going to have times in your Christian life where you'll come into contact with the hard sayings of Jesus. What will we do? How will we respond? You should see them as a grace of God in your life. That you have been rocked out from the comfortable existence of just sporadically attending gatherings, praying when it works, and reading if you feel like it. And the conviction of the Spirit leans in. And how will you respond? See God's grace at work. He wants to give you eternal life. Well, look at the response from the disciples. You see that they grumble. Verse 61, but Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense to this? 
then, then, then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Jesus didn't need to uh, put together the pieces, the murmurs of the crowd, the people discussing and disputing, the grumbling, the, the sideways glances, the looks of contempt along their face. He, he knew what was in their heart. He knew they were taking offense. And they had, of course, taken offense. But you notice when, when, when Jesus is taught and people have taken offense, do you notice Jesus doesn't like desperately try and, and, and soften the blow? He doesn't try and water it down, say, no, 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 you're, you're, listen, listen, hey. What, no, it's all my, he's, he's not trying to make allowances. He actually, he stays the course, doesn't he? Basically he says, if you find this offensive, you're going to find this really offensive. And this is what he says in essence. He says, if you took offense in believing my heavenly origin and the need to trust in my life-giving death, well, how offended are you going to be when I return to heaven to rule and to reign? Jesus is talking about his ascension to go back to where he was before, back to the throne, where you shall be seated at the right hand of the God with full authority. What do people do when they go ascend and return and sit on thrones? They rule and they reign. And it's their authority. It's this authority they don't like. They have a kind of like, who are you to be telling me what to do? Uh, aren't you Joseph's boy? What right do you have? Have you ever felt that towards people in authority? Just me? Come on, you told me about, you told me your, some of your thoughts during COVID and restrictions. But it was interesting, wasn't it? Maybe some of you felt offense when political parties change. New government in town is going to tell you and have some new directions of what you can and can't do. Some of us feel offended. Some of you may feel offended. That's what's happening. Jesus is returning to be Lord, and he's going to show himself that to be Lord, and nothing will be out of reach. He will be Lord over it all, ruling and reigning. Nothing in their lives, nothing in their society, nothing in their religious system gets to remain as is now that Jesus, when he will, ascend and rule and reign. The game's changed. There's a new authority in town. Now, the ascension that um, here is not only towards heaven, but the way John uses the word ascent in his gospel is quite interesting. It's a bit of play on words because John's also going to use the term ascend to talk about how Jesus ascended to the cross when he was lifted up on the cross, his life-giving death. For the cross is something that is shamed and despised. And so for these Jews to think, to hear of a death of Messiah going to die, well, for them this was an offense. People don't like to give up control, do they? People like to keep the reins on their own life, make the decisions that they want. And Jesus is saying, I'm Lord, you don't have to open your hands up. Those who find Jesus' death offensive will find his lordship even more so. The Lordship of Jesus comes to you, to an area of your life, and says, that's mine. That's mine. This relationship, the way you do relationships, that's mine. The, the way you walk out your finances, that's mine. The way you spend your time, th that's mine. I want your opinions to be conformed. I want your lifestyle to be transformed, the new of your mind according to God's word. That's mine. That's mine. And people don't like the lordship of Jesus. They find that offensive. Who are you to tell me what to do? They have a problem with it. All these things in the flesh find the lordship of Jesus hardly, highly offensive. They have then, they do now. It's been the truth throughout history. <laughs> people find it. Jesus' teaching, Jesus claimed to be Lord, offensive. So with Jesus' hard sayings, these two sayings, how on earth does anyone accept them? Like, how on earth do we, in our own flesh, actually accept the hard sayings of Jesus in a way that they uh, produce life in us? How on earth do people whose hearts are set in unbelief ever receive Jesus' words? Well, there's another hard truth that Jesus kind of says here that's kind of smuggled in, but it's a, it's a hard truth that actually has hope. 
And I hope you can see it. The first one was the necessity of Jesus' death, and the second one is Jesus is Lord. The, the third one really here is a reliance on the Spirit. One pastor says, these sayings are so hard that disciples have no chance of accepting them under their own steam. You absolutely need the Spirit if you are to have eternal life. Look at verse 63. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. He says, listen, the way you get life is through my words. This is how I dispense life. This is how you experience life. What, what we're doing right now, the, one of the things we value here at Coomera Baptist Church is the preaching and teaching of God's Word. The way God brings and produces life is through His Word. So we want to preach and teach the Bible. We want to hear the Bible. We want to sing the Bible. We want to get together midweek and study the Bible. We want to get together in small groups, have more of the Bible, reach more of our lives. We want all of you daily delighting in word and prayer because we want you to hear the words of life. Life comes through the Bible, through God's words, through His teaching, what Jesus says. That's where life is found. That's the MO of the Spirit. That's how the Spirit wants to get to work. Let's get some life-giving words at play. Flesh is no help at all, He says. <laughs> it's such a, just kind of plotted in there, the flesh, no help at all. I think, it's, I think it plays two, that means two kind of things. One in this context and then a, in a broader context. The, the, the first in this context, when he says the flesh is no help at all, just think about the conversation Jesus has been having about bread and blood and flesh and consuming it. Think about that for a moment. And this is what he says. And I think as, um, Carson's right when he points this out. He says, if you were to try and take Jesus' words literally without letting the spiritual truths penetrate your heart, they won't do you any good. You don't get eternal life by feasting on the literal body of Jesus. Praise God. And the second truth is this. On our own accord, in the flesh, we cannot secure eternal life. What you can do, what you can achieve, what you bring to the plate is unable to produce eternal life. Our good efforts, they're not good enough. Though we've been raised in a culture that says, <laughs> you can be whoever you want to be. And all the kids who wanted to be astronauts realized the dream was a wrong. Not everyone can be an astronaut. Not everyone can be prime minister. We were told, hey, guess what? If you put your mind to it, you can do whatever you want. You can't. Commonwealth Games are coming up soon. I don't know if there was a window in your life where you thought, I wonder what I'm the best at that might be that good. I'm, it's just, but no one, if you were good enough, you would be there. You know, some, of you, some of you actually have, have been able to compete at that kind of high level. The rest of us, it's like high jump. I'm tall. I'm not that tall. All that lie. You know, it's, just, it's not happening. Swimming? Have you ever tried to do breaststroke for 50 meters? My legs function as an anchor. It's, it's, I can't, no matter how much I want to do it, it's not going to work. Friends, and tri for trivial things like that, how much more for spiritual things like eternal life? You and I can't. The flesh is of no help. Your flesh is not an ally in your ability to secure eternal life or your ability to, to reta retain life with Christ. It's not helpful to you. It's of no use at all. Jesus says, you need to hear my words. You need to receive my words. You need to receive me. Spiritual benefit will not come through the mouth, friends. It will come through the heart as Jesus' words reaches it. We're going to learn to adjust our palate, I think. <laughs> We've got to learn to curate our palate, to love the words of Christ, to feed on Him that we would be with like the prophet Jeremiah who said, when your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight. Oh, isn't that the posture we want for our hearts with God and His words? When you're feeling doubts, when you're struggling in your faith, when you're considering walking away from Jesus, oh, would the sweetness of Christ's words reach your palate? Would it reach your mouth and go into your heart? The words of eternal life. 
because Jesus gives life through his words and gives life through his body, through his atoning sacrifice. We must never separate the two. Friends, we can't receive Jesus without receiving his words. Do you know that to be true? You can't receive Jesus without receiving his words. We ought to at least be a little cautious of the person professing belief in Jesus, yet continuing to knowingly neglect his words. Words are life. Well, Jesus' words are divisive. I want to think, of push the palate metaphor for a moment longer. It's, it's kind of like Vegemite. Those who are attuned to it, who have been born again, love it and receive the, the good gift. There are others, I, particularly Americans, where um, you give them Vegemite and it's, it's just not happening. Their whole body was telling them this looked like chocolate. <laughs> and then they got, you know, surprised. These group that are following Jesus thought, this is good. This is all right. I can follow you. But this talk of bread and body and coming to you in necessity of death, that's not my appetite. Jesus' words are divisive. He has some hard sayings. They simply do not believe. And that's what Jesus brings out in verse 64. He says, but there are some of you who do not believe. He just tells them. Flesh is no good. Spirit gives life. My words are spirit of life, but some of you do not believe. John then tells us in brackets, for Jesus knew from the beginning those who did not believe and who it was or who would betray him. This is why he said, verse 65, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Just as they are reliant on the Spirit to bring life, so they are reliant on the Father to give them to the Son. This is what's going to overcome such unbelief. Without that, people will remain in unbelief. Leon Morris is right when he says, left to himself, the sinner prefers his sin. Left to himself, the sinner prefers his sin. They would never come. They don't want to come. They do not want to believe. They do not want to wholeheartedly rely on Jesus' death and receive his ascension as Lord. The Father gifts to the Son those who would come to him. Now, anyone who wants to come to Jesus will be received. This is true. If you want to come to Jesus, Jesus will receive you. And no one who wants to come to Jesus will be rejected. But in this wider group of 12, and yes, indeed, even the wider group of disciples, and indeed, even in the 12, there are those who do not believe. If Jesus knew and can discern the hearts of people who would believe and who would not believe, doesn't this help kind of explain why, why Jesus doesn't try and water down his message and, and cajole the crowd and, and try and keep them there? He already knows who believes and who doesn't. He knows. He knows what's in their heart. It's a sad reality that some who profess faith do not actually possess faith. Judas professed faith. He did not possess it. Think about Judas for a moment. This is a guy who had position and privilege. He had access to Jesus. He had the attention of Jesus. He was entrusted with ministry responsibilities, preaching of the kingdom. He had it all. Yet he didn't truly believe, did he? Unbelief. That was the condition of his heart. In fact, behind his murderous intent, his deception and his delivering over of Jesus to the authorities, there was a greater enemy at work and at play behind him. The diabolos, the devil. The evil of the devil worked its way through the evil of Judas. The source of it, the one who stood behind the opposition himself was Satan. Jesus knows what's in a man. He knows what's in the hearts of people. So he's been said, John said back in chapter 2, Jesus would not entrust himself to the crowds because he knew what was in a person. He knows and he sees. People may fool us. People may even fool themselves. But you can't fool Jesus. He knows that not all who profess belief in him actually possess true faith. Jesus' teachings are hard to accept, aren't they? (laughs) Jesus' teachings can be hard to accept. You need to accept his death as Savior. 
And you need to accept and trust Him's ascension as Lord. And you need to rely on the work of the Spirit. Christianity is not for the faint-hearted. Christianity isn't for the faint-hearted. It's evident here by the response. There's two responses. Did you see them? Verse, 30, verse 66. After this, many of His disciples turned back and no longer walked with Him. They no longer walked with Him. Those who would turn from Jesus' words eventually turned with their feet. They stopped following Him. As one commentator put it, what they wanted, He would not give. What He offered, they would not receive. And it says many turned back. Many. Not one, not two, many. In fact, by, by best accounts, there wouldn't be any more than 12 remaining. Many turn away. The many who were with Jesus, the many who'd seen the miracles, the many who'd heard the teachings, the many who'd seen his character turned away. They turned away. In my short life, I've seen and known this to happen. And to be honest, reflecting on a pastor like this has just been brutal for my soul this week of the faces and the people who have just turned away from the Lord, sidestepped His goodness, turned away from Him, walked away, and found some hard sayings. They didn't want to follow. Worries of life, pursuit of riches, the dreams, the desires of entertainment, the lusts of the flesh, the comforts, the pursuits took them. Jesus becomes a, a full thought. I'm praying that God would still grant them life and they would return. They would come back to their Savior. Those who are truly His, the Son will keep. But this reality that people will walk away from Jesus might be unsettling, but it ought not be surprising. As J.C. Ryle says, where there is true money, there will always be counterfeit coins. That's the reality we live in. Friends, it's one of the reasons why we want to walk out membership in this church the way we do is because we want to know you and we want to love you and we want to help you continue to walk, follow Jesus so you can enter heaven's gates and walk beside you. We want to help you walk in Jesus' teaching so you won't walk away from the faith. If you're like me, maybe you ask, well, if it's so hard following Jesus, why not walk away? It seems so hard to follow Jesus. Why, what stops you walking away? I had to wonder this morning, do you, do you have a good answer to that question? Do you have a good answer to that question? Why do you not walk away from Jesus? Because the life we live in, you will need to have an answer to that question at some point. Because life will kick you or life will tempt you. And you'll need to have an answer. Why not walk away? Young person. Young people, as you've been raised perhaps in a godly family and you're making decisions now, will you follow Jesus? What will it look like as you set to the trajectory of your life towards standing on your own two feet? What, what will be your reason, your motivation for staying? Married couples, as you, as you settle down in life and start trying to make a new life together in this union, the, the, the trinkets and the pulls and the temptations that will grip and grab you, do you have an answer to the question why you will not pull away and walk away from Jesus? Single people, desiring to follow Jesus faithfully, knowing the, the pulls and the allure of the world, wondering whether Jesus is holding, holding back from you or whether, whether following Him and sticking with Him really is going to get you what you want, do you have an answer to the question, why do you not walk away from Jesus? Older couples, older singles, perhaps by choice or through happenstance or sad circumstance. Do you have, a, do you have, do you have an answer to the question, why do you not walk away from Jesus? Because the world is going to give you an answer if you don't have one from Scripture. The world is going to give you plenty of reasons and plenty of options to walk away, to be deceived. Jesus is wanting us to know His Word, to be stand secure in it, of why we would not walk away. That's what Jesus asked the twelve, didn't He? So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? <laughs> Simon Peter answered Him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. 
Have you ever asked yourself this question? Why do you want to keep following Jesus? Do you want to go away as well? I said before, the world's going to ask you those questions. The world's going to tempt you and lure you away. What is our answer? Oh, how we long to reply with Peter each and every day. Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Isn't that a beautiful passage just right there? That is life-giving words. Lord, to whom shall we go? This is a good moment in Peter's life. Now, if you're familiar with Simon Peter, you'll know this guy speaks up often, but usually he doesn't always hit the nail on the head. This time he actually nails it. Straight in the bullseye. He's speaking on behalf of everyone. He says, Lord, you have the words of eternal light. Notice how personal it is. Notice the motivation. You. Or to who else will we go? Not where else will we go or what else will we do, but who else will we turn to? You have a life. It's deeply personal. And his motivation is, Lord, you have the words of eternal life. Peter's not saying, I reckon you're a good bloke. These guys are good to hang with. I'm just going to hang out. His reason isn't political. I can see you're taking a lead and bringing about change that I like. And his, his motivation is not material. I think there's great gain in following you, Jesus. I'm going to hang around. No, no. It's personal. It's theological. You have the words of eternal life. To whom shall we go? What other teacher can we turn to? What other guide can show us heaven's gates? I, I picture Matthew, the tax collector, thinking to himself, what am I going to do? Go back to ripping people off? Collecting taxes to keep my bosses happy? Or I picture James and John, what are we going to do? Just go back to fishing, punch out the clock day in, day out? Or, Or think of Nathaniel. Do you remember Nathaniel? He read the Torah, he read the Scriptures, he could identify Jesus the Messiah. Is he just going to go back to reading his his Old Testament Scriptures the same way? Just ignorant to the fact that he knows that Jesus is the Messiah? There's no alternative, is there? Because, you know, you can go back to making money. You can go back to just getting by. And you can go the, even go back to your Bible reading. But eventually, you're going to die. You're going to die. Isn't that what Jesus said earlier? That your forefathers had bread that Moses gave and they died. Ate the bread and died. The bread I give you will lead to eternal life. So unless you eat of Jesus, his life and his words, you will not have eternal life. This is a hard saying. But to who else would we go? There's no backup for Peter, no plan B. He doesn't hedge his bets or spread open his options. It's Christ and Christ alone. Upon the solid rock of Christ I stand. All other ground is sifting sand. All other ground is sifting sand. Maybe experience the sifting sand of the world. I know some of your testimonies, you spent some years, some decades away from the Lord and His kindness, He brought you back and you would testify that the Lord... There is no one else to go to. They've come to know that he's the Holy One of God. They may not know it all, but they know there's something distinct about him, different about him, set apart about him. Peter says, who else can we go to? See, friends, when you've you've come to know the goodness of Christ, there is no one else you will satisfy. So what about you? Have you thought through the other options? Have you played them out in your head? Have you been like me at times when you've found Jesus' words hard to swallow and thought, do I have a better option here? Who else can I go to? Jesus has the words of eternal life. You know what's more difficult than walking in obedience to Jesus? not walking with Jesus. So it's hard. But you know what's harder? Not being with Jesus. That's harder. Not walking with the one who died for us. Not walking for the one who granted us eternal life. Gave us himself. Gave, gifted us with grace. I just wonder, for those who may be tempted today, wondering if you're going to walk away from Jesus, just tell me, how's the other option going to come through for you? 
How's that guy going to save your soul? How's that girl going to cover your guilt? How's that extra cash going to bring you peace? How is that morality going to protect you when Jesus returns? Explain to me how Sunday morning sport or leisure time is somehow going to scratch the eternal itch for which you were made to come and worship Jesus. Just, just let me know. It can't. Instead, we hold on to Jesus by holding on to his words. Jesus is saying, hey, stick around. You'll find out in the end. By God's grace, you'll find out now the blessings of following him. Will you and I still find some of Jesus' teachings hard to accept? Yes. I'm not giving you an easy sell here this morning. You'll find it hard to accept. I find it hard to accept sometimes. Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Could that not be sung of us at many points, perhaps many days? Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. See, friends, our hope we have this morning is not that we would hold on to Jesus, but that Jesus is holding on to us. See what Jesus tells Peter? Peter's made this big declaration of not going anywhere. Jesus gently and also decisively reminds him, did I not choose you, Peter? Did I not choose the twelve? I initiated this thing, Peter. And I don't know what was going on in Jesus' heart when he said that. Because he knew one of the twelve was going to betray him, Judas. Jesus was heading to the cross to atone for the sins of the world, eyes wide open. Nothing would catch him by surprise. If Jesus would never turn away from us, then friends, why would we ever turn away from him or his words? What we do with this as a church, well, I just want you to know as a church, we're going to continue to preach and teach the whole counsel of God. We're going to preach and teach the uncomfortable pieces, difficult pieces that don't line up with where culture says and stands. We're going to do so gently and hopefully the tone of the passage will do so pastorally and patiently along the way. And we'll walk with you as long as, as long as it takes to walk through some of the more difficult parts of applying Scripture in our lives. And I pray that our posture will just be humble hearts, right? Do you know the key to not being offended by Jesus' words? Humility is the frame of mind which we should labor for and pray if we would not be offended by Scripture's teaching. The only time I'm offended by Scripture's teaching is when I'm walking in pride. But I don't want to apologize first. I don't want to have to go and initiate a conversation of reconciliation. I don't have to admit my sin. That's just pride. Oh, friends, when we walk in humbly, Jesus' teachings... Jesus' words become soothing to your soul. The grace gets in a little bit more, a little bit deeper. Secondly, as we as a church will do this, as I said, we're gonna, we will walk with you. We will walk beside you, helping you accept some of the harder teachings of Jesus, helping you walk by the Spirit. Now, we know for some of us this will be harder than others. Some people in the Lord's providence just receive the collective teachings of Scripture and some of us in certain life circumstances or backgrounds are going to find some things harder to digest. That's okay. Let's keep walking with Jesus, for He has the words of eternal life. And along the way, we're just going to remind each other, there's nowhere else to go. Jesus has the words of eternal life. Let us remember that this morning. Let's pray.